Hey everyone, my name is Tomato Anus, also known as the Migraine Giver, and this is a segmented any percent no major glitches speedrun of Hollow Knight. This run is performed by Lep, a top runner for the game who's been speedrunning Hollow Knight for a little over a year and a half, and who helped me write the script to make sure it's all as accurate as possible. This run, despite being any percent, has several major glitches banned, such as any glitch that makes you invulnerable, any glitch that puts you out of bounds, any form of item duplication, and more. So if you've never played Hollow Knight before, it's a Metroidvania where you play as the Knight. The game opens with the knight arriving at a quiet town named Dirtmouth, which lies above the ruins of a kingdom named Hollow Nest. Hollow Nest has become overrun with something called the Infection, and over the course of the game, you control the knight and venture deep into the ruins to confront the source of the Infection. With this being a Metroidvania, the game is focused on non-linearity and utility-gated exploration slash progression. By that I mean that as you explore the large interconnected map, you unlock new abilities which allow you to explore previously inaccessible areas and shortcuts throughout the map. Because of this, exploration is a core mechanic, and scattered throughout the map are benches for the player to sit on, which are more or less checkpoints where you respawn, heal, and do a handful of other actions. Overall, in order to beat the game, you need to collect three NPCs called Dreamers, which opens up access to the final boss so you can beat the game. Strictly speaking, this is all you need to do to beat the game, and this would serve as the list of everything you need to do to finish the run. For the purposes of this video though, I've made an arbitrary, cherry-picked list of things Lep has to do to beat the game and the run, just to serve as a guide for more casual viewers to have to help keep track of how far into the game and run he is. There's of course a lot more things he does in the route than this, and again, strictly speaking, the only thing he needs to do is collect the dreamers to get to the final boss, but the purpose of this list isn't to be all encompassing. Alright, with that all being covered, let's get into the- Hey Chicago guy, what's this? Yeah, big guy's out of town, so he had chat GPT write our lines for this one. Hey Minnesota guy, have you heard of Surfshark VPN? It, it says I'm supposed to juggle oranges? I don't even know how to juggle. Just go with it. Have you ever heard of Surfshark VPN? Wait, now I'm supposed to try and untangle yarn? Did Tomato give us any props for this? Surfshark VPN is a virtual private network that encrypts all the info sent between your device and the internet, keeping your data safe from big companies and criminals. Duh, yeah, screw it. I'll just pretend I'm holding yarn. Hang on, Chicago guy. This yarn is a mess. Good job. You're killing it. Since Surfshark is a VPN, it also changes your IP address so that it appears you're in a different country. You can use it to bypass geo restrictions and access content libraries for streaming services in other countries. I can finally watch my favorite movie on Netflix now. Why does yarn have to be so complicated? <sighs> Hey Chicago guy, why did the AI write me to be super dense? Surfshark also has the clean web feature that blocks ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts, all helping you surf the web safely. Is... is this how people see me? Am... am I the bumbling roommate? And don't forget that you can get real-time alerts with it, helping monitor your personal data and checking for any potential breaches. You can get 83% off and 3 extra months free by using the link and code in the description below. Also, Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's absolutely no risk to try it out. Again, use the link and code that are in the description below. Hey Minnesota guy, are you doing okay? I... I need a minute. I... I think I'm having an existential crisis. So right away, you'll likely notice that Lep's game is in simplified Chinese. This is because overall, the language generally has fewer characters and the text scrolls faster than English and overall saves 5 seconds over English. You gotta admire the commitment of speedrunners spending years to learn a new language just to do a run slightly faster. That was a joke, you don't need to learn the language to run the game. So right away, when you start the game, you normally fall straight down at max speed, and you have what's called a hard fall, where the knight lands, um, very hard, and they sit there for a moment before being able to move. First off, Lep is going to pause and unpause as early as he can, which gives him control and lets him move around in air, which he'll take advantage of by starting to move to the right. He's then going to do what's called an inventory drop, where he'll open his inventory, which uncaps his falling speed so he falls much faster. You may think this would cause him to land even harder, but it actually skips the hard fall animation animation and, in total, saves around 5 seconds. Something worth noting is that Lep is performing this run on version 1.2.2.1, which is an older version of the game, and inventory drops are a lot easier to do on this patch than on current patch runs. Alright, let's actually start the game now and see the initial inventory drop. He then begins making his way through the area, destroying the doors in his way and also some decorations like grass as well. 
destroying decorations isn't required or faster or anything, it's just this area is boring if you do it over and over, so it's something to distract the mind. In this next room, he's going to lure a Vengefly back to the ledge where he entered the room and down air attack off it to reach a floating platform. These down air attacks are typically referred to as pogos because of their effect when you hit something with them, just for future reference. After hopping up the platforms, he's then going to do something called a nail turnaround. The knight's weapon is called the nail, and when you attack a wall with it, you're slightly pushed away from the wall. Lep is going to use this to his advantage by attacking a wall just before and as he turns around to change direction, which gives him a tiny speed boost in the new direction he's headed. He's going to use a nail turnaround up here to change direction faster as he hops up to this ledge. After the turnaround, he's going to go through a door where the floor is going to collapse, and Lep will do a little jump as the floor crumbles below him. If you're standing on the ground, when it gives way under you, then when you land, there's a chance that you get a hard fall regardless of how far you fall. But if you're in the air when this floor collapses, then you completely avoid that scripted interaction and the chance for the hard fall is completely removed. You still have to fall a short enough distance to not get a hard fall though, so Lep will make sure to land just at the edge right here since if he lands on the next level down, he'd get a hard fall. Even though if he kept holding right, he'd be farther into the area and save time that way, the time loss from the hard fall would make it lose more time overall compared to letting up a little to land higher up. Something worth mentioning real quick is that this game has input buffering. For example, if Lep is jumping repeatedly, he can press and hold his next jump input shortly before landing and it'll automatically register and happen the moment he lands and cause him to jump immediately. Similarly, if he's attacking with a nail, he can press and hold his next attack while the first attack is playing out, and he'll attack as soon as the first attack finishes. So coming up is when Lep will be arriving to the town of Dirtmouth, which I mentioned in the intro of the video, and when he moves through the town, he's going to constantly jump. This is because when you're walking through cities or some areas with NPCs, the knight will walk slower, but their speed remains unchanged while jumping. The exact numbers are that the normal walking speed is 8.3 units, while the in-town walking speed is 6 units, so you move it around 3 quarters speed if you don't jump. Up ahead, he's going to go down a hole in the ground, and rather than just walk and fall into it, he's going to time a jump in advance so that he falls into the hole with the speed he built up from the jump, rather than entering the hole with zero vertical velocity from walking in. This is a little piece of tech called pre-jumping, which he's going to do a lot throughout the run, pretty much any time he needs to round a corner and fall. This here is the pre-jump. In the room after this one, he has to drop all the way down and will do an inventory drop to do it quickly. There are flying enemies in the room called Gruzzers, and they don't have set spawns, meaning you can get bad luck and be hit by one when falling, so Lep drops more in the middle of the room since you're less likely to hit any Gruzzers if you drop there. In the next room, he'll drop down and enter a room on the right where he's going to enter a combat encounter where he has to kill some Aspid Hunters. After pogoing off the first one multiple times to kill it, he's going to go to the top left corner where he'll trigger a stalactite to fall. He'll hit it down and right at an angle to snipe two hunters that spawn to kill them instantly. He's then going to make his way through the next couple rooms, and his goal right now is to get the Vengeful Spirit spell. Since he just started the game, he doesn't have the Mothwing Cloak yet, meaning he can't dash, so the early stretch of this run is largely holding forward through rooms and trying not to bonk into anything. Worth mentioning, this game has a currency in it called Geo, which you get from various things such as killing enemies, destroying Geo deposits, opening chests, and more. You can use Geo to purchase stuff from merchants and pay tolls to unlock benches and fast travel points, and in this run, Lep will need to collect a cumulative 2,670 Geo. So in addition to pogoing enemies, you can also pogo some objects in the background, like this statue he pogos here. He's currently on his way to the first boss of the run, the False Knight. There are a few enemy husks in the boss arena before the boss drops in, and Lep wants to make it easier to collect all their Geo when they're killed. He jumps as he approaches the first husk so that he avoids its aggro box, so that after he then pogos off of it to reach the other side of it, the husk notices him for the first time and chases him to the left near the other husks so that its geo isn't out of reach. For the fight against the false knight, it's mostly just a bunch of nail hits and trying to be optimal with attacking him whenever possible. When the false knight jumps, Lep tries to follow his movement in air to land nail hits, which is referred to as tracing the false knight's movement. The thing about this fight though, is that you actually only have to complete the first phase of the fight, because as soon as phase 2 starts, you're able to break down the wall on the left side of the arena and leave the fight, which is exactly what Lep will do. You may be asking why he doesn't stick around for the fight if he needs to farm Geo for later in the run, or get the reward item, the City Crest, that lets you go to a different area, the City of Tears. It's mainly because there's great places to get Geo later, and sticking around for this fight would overall be slower than getting the Geo from the good farming spot later on, and he'll be entering the City of Tears in a different way later and doesn't need the City Crest for it. Lep really didn't even come this way to fight the False Knight anyway, it's just that he's in the way of getting to the first spell, Vengeful Spirit. 
So in here is where Lep grabs Vengeful Spirit, which is a spell that shoots a spirit blast fireball type thing, and you'll notice that the recording gets real choppy when he grabs it. This is because the pickup animation is pretty poorly optimized and it freaks out Lep's encoder, and it's to the point where speedrunners get different times for this room, and people with slower PCs are unable to get a room time the same as the community best. Thankfully, it's not the end of the world, and you can still get a full game world record with a slower PC. It doesn't affect the run too much overall. Getting Vengeful Spirit begins a little tutorial room for it, which Lep begins by hitting the plank above him as he begins heading right since he's going to be coming back through the hole the plank was in, so may as well start clearing the blockage now. After he climbs up the right side of the room up here, he's going to pogo off an enemy at the top to more or less do a pre-jump to drop down, where he'll swing the nail late enough to hit both levels of planks blocking the hole so he doesn't have to stop falling to break the second plank. At the end of this Vengeful Spirit tutorial area, he has to fight an Elder Boulder that's blocking the way. The big Big white meter in the top left corner is Lep's soul meter, which is the pool that's drawn from to cast spells, with each spell cast costing one third of the soul meter. He has enough soul to do three casts of Vengeful Spirit, but it takes four casts to kill the Elder Balder, so he has to wait for the Balder to spit out an enemy for him to attack to regain soul to be able to do the fourth cast, which, worth mentioning, every nail hit fills up one ninth of the soul meter. It's important to note that Lep hasn't sat down at any benches yet, and in this situation, the game kinda assigns a bench for you to respawn at if you quit out, and now that he's been near the Vengeful Spirit bench, the game updated that to the assigned bench. So now that he has Vengeful Spirit, he's able to go get the Mothwing Cloak, which provides the dash ability, and he couldn't get it earlier since it's blocked by an Elder Balder, but he can kill it now that he has Fireballs. Getting dash is pretty much priority number one for the speedrun category since it helps him move faster, and as he walks towards Green Path, the place where the Mothwing Cloak is, he attacks as many small enemies in his path as possible to fill up his soul. In total, he needs two-thirds soul so that he can shoot two Fireballs, and after walking close enough to the Balder here to wake it up so that the Fireball will hit him, Lep walks back so the balder is just off screen and then shoots a fireball at him. When the fireball goes off screen here, its hitbox stays out and continually hits the elder balder, killing him with just one shot instead of four like the earlier one. It's a bit similar to that BFG weapon wheel trick I talked about in Doom 2016. So after killing the Elder Balder, he's going to cross a gap that he wouldn't be able to normally, but he does a fireball skip where he shoots a fireball backwards in air, which both pushes him back slightly and resets his fall speed, letting him reach the other side. This saves two seconds and brings him to Green Path proper, which is an area lush with vegetation and guarded by a bunch of leafy dudes called Mosskin. Most of Green Path is going to be just holding left and attacking Mosskin where possible to build up soul, along with a couple fireball skips. In an upcoming room, we're going to see Hornet for the first time, and in that room, Lep will do another fireball skip and shoot two fireballs to do it. It isn't necessary to shoot both fireballs in order to do this skip, but he has enough soul to afford shooting two, and since each fireball provides a little pushback, it just makes the skip easier to do and a bit safer. It is technically slower to shoot extra fireballs, with each extra one losing 0.3 seconds, but it's a trade-off that's up to the runner to make. In the room after this one, he's going to hop up and perform the third and final fireball skip, and then have to run past a couple husks in a hall with a low ceiling. The two husks there have random locations, so getting past them isn't always the same, and the low ceiling makes it a bit harder to get past them at times. In this room, Lep tries to hit as many enemies as he can while passing through to build up soul because in the following room he has to fight a Moss Knight, which is a stronger enemy. To kill a Moss Knight, you need to do one nail hit and three fireballs, but rather than just hit it once and cast three fireballs, he's going to hit it once, cast a fireball, and then jump up and at it before casting the second fireball. Jumping at it like this causes the Moss Knight to jump backwards, which makes the second fireball hit twice and kill it. This also benefits picking up the Geo since it's all a little farther away and in a clean line to pick up, rather than being scattered on both sides of Lep. Because he only needed to cast two fireballs in that fight, he has a bit of extra soul right now, so he doesn't really need to go out of his way to hit enemies for extra soul, and is pretty much fine with whatever hits he can get in along the way. At the end of the room here, Lep will do a little pre-jump into the next room where he's going to drop to the bottom left to fight a Moss Knight by some Geo Deposits. There's a second Moss Knight on the same floor as the Knight by the Deposits that Lep wants to kill for his Geo, but he randomly moves left or right when you enter the room, and he went right in this run, which is slightly slower since Lep wants to wait until he wanders back on screen, so he has to use fewer fire fireballs to take the knights out. Lep jumps at this first knight so it jumps back so that he can then alternate nail hits and fireballs to break the geo deposit sooner. Taking out these two knights is a newer change to the route, with older routes having runners fight a different guy in the top of the room, and this newer route gives a bit more leniency early in the run with having to collect geo since you get around 150 for taking them and the deposits out. He's now on his way to the boss battle against Hornet. 
Hornet has a pretty low stagger count, with stagger being when you hit a boss enough times in succession, the game freezes for a moment and they're knocked down allowing you to get extra hits in, or heal, or do whatever. He wants to bully her into a corner and stagger her as much as possible because she can't jump away if she's staggered, and her jumping away is bad right now since left doesn't have a dash or anything yet, so he has to run across the arena to hit her again, which is slow. Once he's finally dealt enough damage to her for the fight to end, she zips away and the shambling corpse of the knight's predecessor falls over, letting Lep grab the moth wing cloak. Like I mentioned a little bit ago, the Mothwing Cloak provides the dash ability, which can be used both while on the ground or in air, with you being limited to dashing once in the air, and the air dash being refreshed when you touch the ground. Dashing is faster than walking normally, so Lep is going to be doing it as much as he can for now, and the ability has a 0.4 second cooldown between dashes. The thing about dashing, though, is that it has a set length to it. Every time you dash, you go the same distance. This is a bit suboptimal when it comes to dashing off a ledge where you might want to drop straight down, since the time you could be spent moving downwards is instead spent in the remainder of the dash. That's where inventory drops come back in. An additional application of inventory drops is that it cancels you out of the dash animation, so Lep will use that to shorten his dashes when necessary. So as soon as he grabs the cloak, he quits out and loads back in, which respawns him at the bench by where he got Vengeful Spirit that the game auto-assigned as his checkpoint. This saves a ton of time that would otherwise be spent running through the map. Right away, he starts dashing, and to the left here, he does his first inventory drop to cancel a dash and begin falling right away. I want to emphasize that you can only dash once while in air, and you have to land on the ground to refresh your air dashes. So now that he has the Mothwing Cloak, he's making his way to his next key item slash ability. Mantis Claw. Mantis Claw is located in the Mantis Village in the Fungal Wastes, and lets you cling to walls and jump off them, which is a pretty key item when it comes to traversing the map since it basically allows you to wall jump and also slide down walls. He's making his way there right now by doing a ton of dashes and inventory drops, and is going to do something called the Setic Slash in a second. He'll be dropping down and needing to reach a ledge on the right at the bottom of the drop, but the right wall of the drop extends over the ledge, so he can't just fall onto the ledge while holding right. The Setic Slash is where he'll face the left and attack a platform with the nail just before the wall on the right ends and use the pushback from the attack to make the knight move to the right and make it to the ledge safely. It happens really quick and is hard to see and is going to happen right after I unpause now. So as he progresses through the fungal waste, he's trying to get pop shots in on random enemies and objects here and there to build up soul, since he needs some to perform a major sequence break that's coming up. This room is super clean with the pre-jump here, and then timing his dash here so that he falls just past this platform and doesn't connect with it and lose momentum. Now is a good time to address a misconception about inventory drops and a couple important things to know about them. First is they aren't inherently faster to perform, since they only uncap your fall speed, so if you weren't going to hit your max fall speed in a drop anyways, it wouldn't save any time to do one. The other Another big thing is that inventory drops reset your fall speed when you do them, so if he's falling a bit beforehand, doing a drop might actually lose time due to his fall speed going back to zero and building back up. So down here, Lep is going to do a trick called an Explosion Pogo, and more specifically, a variant of it called the Fire Pogo, named after a runner named Fireborn. Maybe you've heard of him. Normally at this spot, you'd have to follow the map to the right and go all the way around to be able to get back to this ledge up here on the left. What Lep is going to do though, is bait this exploding spore fired by this spork down to here. He's then going to pogo off this mushroom to get height and dash under this ledge where he'll then turn around and shoot a fireball into the spore to explode it. On this patch, almost any damage source is pogoable, so Lep is going to pogo off the explosion to be able to reach the ledge up here, which skips going to the right and going all the way around. Overall, this saves around 40 seconds. Also, coming up soon is a boss fight, so I should probably cover an important piece of tech beforehand called nail cancelling. In short, a nail cancel is casting a fireball as soon as possible after a nail hit so that you cast during the nail cooldown. It's called a nail cancel because of how the animations appear to overlap, but it's worth noting that you're not actually cancelling the nail hit, just throwing out something right after and overlapping the animations. Nail cancelling massively ups your damage per second and is commonplace in every boss fight, and some other fights in general like when Lep took out the Moss Knights just a little bit ago. So after he drops through this room and gets some more soul, he'll enter the Mantis Claw room from the top, which isn't the intended entrance since you're supposed to enter it from the right. After hitting this switch to open a gate, he pogos off two Mantis U's he baited below a ledge so he can reach the gate and skip backtracking. Quick nail turnaround there, then he takes his time getting to the Claw since he wants a Mantis youth to follow him and hit him as he grabs the Claw, which gives him control right away and lets him quit out immediately to load back in at the Vengeful Spirit Bench. Waiting for the youth loses around 6 seconds, but then being able to save and quit out early saves around 8 seconds, so overall this is about a 2 second time save. So although getting the Mantis Claw is pretty necessary for this run, it does make the general movement a bit tighter. What I I mean by this is throughout the run, Lep of course is trying to cut corners as closely as possible and be as greedy as possible with his movement to save fractions of a second on every turn and drop. 
He has to be super careful with it now, though, with not going too tight on corners and going near walls, because if he gets too close, then he'll accidentally grab onto the wall with the claw and reset his fall speed, which loses time. Lep is now moving forward through the Forgotten Crossroads, similar to Green Path, where he's mainly just holding forward and trying to get as much soul as possible from enemies as he makes his way to the Gruz Mother boss fight. Gruz Mother is one of the easier boss encounters in Hollow Knight because she doesn't do much damage and all of her attacks are easily read and countered. She's located in the southeast corner of the Crossroads and blocks Sly the Shopkeeper and Charm Lover Salubra, as well as a passageway to the Resting Grounds area. Here he purchases a Stag Station, which is this game's form of a fast travel location. He's actually been near this station before, and while it would have been more optimal from a movement standpoint to purchase the station then, he didn't have the Geo for it then, and he also has Dash now, so moving through the station room is slightly faster now. He mainly bought the station for later, as he's now back on track for heading to Gruz Mother and farming Soul along the way. When he arrives at Gruz Mother up here, both the fight and her are short-lived, since he's able to take her out super quickly by nail cam canceling a ton. She drops exactly 50 Geo, making up for the Stag Station purchase, and Lep then swings the nail a few times to time out a jump with when a bunch of Gruzzers burst out of their mommy's belly, which Lep takes out by shooting a fireball at the top of the pack, then the bottom to clear out the stragglers. This opens up the right side of this big room, which is what Lep's overall goal was here. He'll rest on the bench up ahead to update his respawn location, and then head into the shack there to talk with Charm Lover Salubra, from whom he'll purchase the Shaman Stone. This will be the only charm he buys in the run, and it increases the power of the fireball from 15 to 20 damage, for a reference Nail does 5 damage, and it also makes the spell bigger, which makes double hitting things easier. This charm makes a lot of fights easier, and some just doable in general, which overall justifies the time and geo spent buying it. On his way out of the shack, he takes some intentional damage from some husks, then heads into a different shack and speaks with Sly the shopkeeper to wake him up so that he'll relocate to Dirtmouth later on, where Lep will buy something from him. He then takes some more intentional damage to die so that he respawns at the nearby bench, where he uses the time that's wasted of the knight sitting on the bench to equip the charm he just bought. Dying in this game spawns a shade who you have to kill to get your geo back and fix your now broken soul meter. And here Lep lures the shade to the right where he jumps off the wall and pogos off the shade to reach a hidden pathway, which is a sequence break. Using a shade like this is called a shade skip, which there are plenty of in the game, but in this specific speedrun category and route, this is the only one that's done. This brings us to the first glitch of the run, wall cling storage. Up front, again, this category is called no major glitches, and wall cling storage is a glitch that's really broken and in many cases considered to be a major glitch due to how extreme some sequence breaks are that you can do with it and how you can kinda gain super speed with it. Walkling storage's use is restricted in this category, and this specific instance you're about to see is allowed because of what the Hollow Knight speedrunning community refers to as the topology rule. This is a rule that more or less says that you can use the glitch to speed up going through areas that you can normally go through with the same equipment you currently have. So it wouldn't be necessary to use the glitch to get through this room right now, but it just makes the room a bit faster. This may sound incredibly arbitrary, but hey, speedrunning is an incredibly arbitrary hobby. This and most of the allowed applications of walkling storage tend to make boring movement a little more interesting and faster without drastically changing the route, which is generally why it's allowed in this restricted form. So the way you'd normally have to go through this room is to slowly waddle through this water, but with walkling storage, you're able to maintain dash speed for the majority of it and chain it a little at the end of the room. So how does this work and how is it executed? Inside the game, there's a variable for whether you're touching a wall or not. If you're touching a wall, then the variable is true, and if you're not, then the variable is false. To start the setup for the glitch, you first need to be close enough to the wall that the game considers you to be touching the wall, but as far away from the wall as possible while the game still thinks you're touching it. This is a pretty small window, but thankfully, the community has several consistent setups to get into this state of being not right up against the wall, but still technically touching it. The setup that Lep does in this run is done by dashing into this corner slash ledge here, which sets his horizontal position, doing a nail slash once to knock himself back slightly, and then doing a dash. Normally, the game checks pretty constantly whether or not you're touching the wall. The game runs the check if you either leave the wall, touch a different wall, touch a floor, or touch a ceiling. So for example, say you're initially touching the wall normally, like not with the specific setup Lep does that considers him touching despite being a cunt hair away from the wall. So you're nuzzling the wall, then jump and move away from the wall. The game runs the check when you leave the wall, as it's supposed to, and the variable updates to say you're no longer touching a wall, as it should. The thing is though, this specific check that takes place when you leave the wall does not happen when you're in the setup where you're touching the wall but slightly away from it. So if you're in the setup location and jump and move away, the game still considers you to be touching the wall. Every other check still works as intended though, meaning that this state of having moved away from the wall and the game considers you to be still touching it lasts only as long as you don't touch the ground, another wall, or a ceiling. If you do any of those, then the check is ran, the game will see you're not touching the wall, and the variable will update. In order to perform wall cling storage, 
storage, Lep needs to make sure that the variable does not update and that the game continues to think that he's touching the wall while he makes his way dashing over the water, which, important to note, the game does not check if he's touching a wall when he impacts the water. So he needs to get to the water and have the game think that he's touching the wall, which means that from this corner, he needs to maneuver to the water without touching this wall, this ceiling, or these floors. The way to actually perform wall cling storage then is he'll continually jump so that he's not in the water and unable to dash, he'll dash to the right, and then hold left while he's coming out of each dash. The way this works is that when he's holding left, the game thinks he's clinging onto the wall since the game thinks he's touching the wall, and his dash momentum is preserved when the game thinks he's clinging to the wall. So by continually jumping, dashing right, and holding left when coming out of the dashes, he pretty much crosses this entire lake at the same speed he dashes at, since his dashing momentum is constantly preserved. Fun fact and side note, he can actually do this in either direction. He doesn't need to specifically move right and hold left to make the game think that he's clinging to the wall that was on his left. When he enters the water, the flag for which side the wall was on goes away, so by holding either left or right, the game thinks that he's clinging onto the wall, and he no longer has to hold the direction of the wall he was clinging to when he comes out of dashes, so he can just hold right the entire time. So yeah, that's how he's going to zoom over this lake like a skipping stone thrown by Andrew Garfield. Just the wrist, just all in the wrist, buddy. In this next room, he's going to wall jump on the left to a little nook where he's able to hit a lever through the ground so that the slow moving gate starts opening now and is open by the time he gets to it. So the shade skip that left did was a pretty major sequence break. Normally you'd have to go down into Deep Nest and get a pass to take the tram, then take the tram into the City of Tears, but instead he kinda just cut across to here, where he's going to get the Dream Nail. The Dream Nail is probably the most key item in terms of progression, since it's required to have it in order to collect the Dreamers, who are kinda the three big main objectives of the game aside from defeating the final boss. The door to the final boss has three seals on it, and defeating each Dreamer breaks their respective seals, so defeating them all is necessary in order to get to the final boss. Right away, he's going to dash off the platform he spawns on to get the moth he has to follow to the Dream Nail to spawn a little faster, which saves around a second. He'll then have to do some platforming to get to the Dream Nail, and he'll start off by dashing to where the first platform will be as it spawns, because Lep is fancy like that. This section is pretty standardized with him just holding forward, dashing whenever he can, and trying not to bonk into anything. Because you can only do so many dashes in a section like this, the final time for this area is pretty consistent, with it always being around the same. After he collects the Dream Nail up here, he's going to pause and unpause to regain control earlier and leave right away. Because of this, he'll have control while the animation of the knight waking up back in the resting grounds is playing out, so he'll be sliding on his face on the ground, which actually functions essentially the same as an inventory drop, since the animation is only supposed to happen while you're grounded, so it uncaps his fall speed. So the wall cling storage that Lep did a couple minutes ago is a variation called corner wall cling storage, which is where he set it up in a corner next to a wall. Up ahead, he's going to do a different version called transitional wall cling storage, where he's going to be touching a wall as he transitions into a different room, and since he only needs to be touching the wall, he's going to do a down slash in the air so he doesn't grab the wall and lose any fall speed. When he enters the room after setting it up and he hops immediately, the game still thinks he's touching the wall and he's able to dash repeatedly and fly through the room. Even though you normally can only dash once in air, because the game thinks he's on a wall, he can dash repeatedly, and again, this is allowed because traversing the room is something he'd be able to do normally with all of his current items, it's just that this is a bit faster. At the bottom of this elevator ride, he's going to do the third and final version of wall cling storage where he'll dash into the elevator's gate as it's opening. This makes the the game think he's clinging to the closed gate even though it's open so he can dash repeatedly to exit the room which saves a fraction of a second. As he maneuvers through the City of Tears here, he's going to hit as many enemies as he can to build up soul since he needs a lot to be able to cast a couple times to kill the enemies he's going to pass on this floor for Geo. On the right here, he picks up a relic, which is a Wanderer's Journal, which he can sell to an NPC later for 200 Geo. He's going to pick up a couple of these throughout the run so he can sell them. Speaking of Geo, the main purpose of this stretch of the run is to collect Geo, and in a couple rooms, he's going to enter a hut. In the hut, he'll run past a bunch of enemies that die in one fireball and hit the taller enemy of the group with two nail hits since it takes two nail hits into fireball to die. He runs past them since he's going to fight an enemy in the back of the hut first, and he'll clear out the enemies up front with the one fireball on his way out. Back here, he fights a gorgeous husk, which is a pretty consistent fight and damage rotation which he lands a couple double fireballs in. The husk drops 420 Geo, sex number, nice, and then he shoots a fireball on his way out to clear clear out the remaining enemies from the entrance of the hut to collect an additional 30 Geo or so. Back outside, he's going to dash through the 
rain like a moody anime protagonist, and after that, Lep is going to go into another elevator and ride it up. When the elevator approaches the top, he's going to do some wall jumps on the left and time it out so that he doesn't have to wait for the elevator to stop at the top to walk out. He then does a pogo off an object in the background to reach this ledge, which is a pretty major sequence break since you normally need wings to get up here as he makes his way to the first dreamer of the run. So coming up is the reason why he plays on specifically this patch and not an earlier one where most of the stuff he's doing is also doable. He's going to wall jump repeatedly to get up to this corner where he's going to slash upwards to hit a lever through the floor that's hidden in the dark. That'll open this gate that's blocking the path to this lever. Hitting this lever through the ground is only doable on patch 1.2.2.1. It's not available on any earlier or later patches. Normally you have to go to the left up here, fight a mini boss and hit a lever over there to open a different gate that's down to the right, then climb up to get to the room that the lever is in. Because you're not supposed to go straight into this room, the room is blacked out and it stays that way until you walk through the room at the bottom through the opened gate after defeating the mini boss. Since he's not going that way though, Lep is going to navigate this room entirely in the dark. Just for reference, this is what the room looks like, but yeah, he's going to do it with the room being pitch black. He'll then progress through the area a little and arrive at a fight against the Watcher Knights. The Watcher Knights guard Lurian, one of the Dreamers, and you have to defeat multiple Watcher Knights in the fight. Before he enters the arena to fight them though, Lep is going to wall jump up and destroy a ceiling. There he'll do another dev intended skip by breaking a chain to cause a chandelier to fall on and kill one of the Watcher Knights before starting the fight proper. Good thing Kesha wasn't swinging from that chandelier. With the way this fight plays out in this any% percent run, you start off fighting just one Watcher, with a pair of two spawning after you kill that one, and another pair of two spawning after you kill those two. This makes for a total of 5 Watchers to fight, but it would be 6 if you didn't drop the chandelier to kill one. The Watchers have 3 moves they can do. There's a 60% chance they'll stand there and slash at you, a 20% chance they roly poly -oly around, and a 20% chance they roly poly -oly while bouncing back and forth. Additionally, Watchers can only do the slash if you're in range, and if you aren't in range when it tries to do it, it'll walk up to you to get into range. If it doesn't get close enough after a set amount of walking, then it'll roly poly -oly after walking that distance. Also, they can only do 3 of an attack in a row, so if one's done 3 in a row, which is most commonly 3 slashes, it'll be forced to choose one of the other attack options. So while they're roly poly -oly you can't hit them with a nail, but you can and damage them with fireballs. This means for this fight, the name of the game is Hollow Knight by Team Cherry. This run is performed by Lep, a top runner for the game who's been speedrunning this game. Pfft, whoa, sorry, don't know what happened there. Some kind of Pavlovian out of body experience. Where was I? Oh, right. You can't hit them with the nail during their roly poly -oly attacks, but you can damage them with fireballs. That means that for this fight, the name of the game is Hollow Knight by Team Cherry. This run is performed by. Fuck! I did it again. For this fight, the general game plan, there we go, is to take advantage of their slash attacks when they can be hit by the nail to build up soul, and to focus on spending that soul when they roly poly -oly, so damage is still being dealt to them. Side note, Lep now has the Dream Nail, which while its main story use is for collecting the Dreamers, it can also be used on other enemies. These Dream Nail attacks fill up one third of the soul meter as opposed to the normal one ninth, and also tells you the enemy's thoughts, but it doesn't do any damage. It takes a moment for this attack to charge up, so he won't do it in the chaos of when the Watchers are moving around and attack but he'll sneak some in as the Watchers spawn. Another big thing for this fight is that when they're roly poly olying in one direction, if you cast a fireball, the fireball can hit them up to three times thanks to how fast they roll in one direction, so fireballs can really melt them if timed properly. Overall, this fight is really a push-pull of trying to get soul when you're able to, and focusing on casting fireballs when you're unable to collect soul. There will be times though when the Watchers will be in a good setup for collecting soul, but Lep will already have full soul, so he'll instead cast since it deals more damage than a nail hit so that he isn't just wastefully trying to build up an already full soul meter. The best time to build up soul is when the watchers are standing next to each other, since a nail attack hits both of them and builds up twice the soul. And speaking of hitting both, Lep is going to try and hit both of them with one fireball cast as much as he can to optimize the damage dealt. One of the main ways he gets so many fireballs off that hits both is he does a lot of pogos, even when just staying on one side of a watcher and shooting fireballs. Doing this is slightly lower damage per second than standing on the ground while attacking and casting fireballs, but Lep does it so much because it allows him to dash over the watchers sooner if he sees an opportunity to cast a fireball and hit both. Positioning is super important in this fight, and Lep feels that the slightly lower damage per second is worth it because when you see a window to hit both with one fireball, you have to take it. Overall, doing this fight with the equipment Lep has is probably the biggest barrier to newer runners since it's pretty challenging, but because of that, it's the single most practiced split amongst runners. It's one of those segments where you just really have to build up your intuition to be able to do it cleanly and quickly. Alright, so now that all that is covered, let's get back to the run. So again, he hits the lever through the floor to open the gate to the pitch black room that 
he blindly maneuvers through. After emerging from the darkness like Aaron Rodgers, which boo by the way he sucks and that isn't just my Bears fan agenda speaking, he hit a dude to gain a little soul and wall jumped on this elevator to exit it early. He then skips this elevator in favor of wall jumping to the top, and at the top, he then wall jumps and casts a fireball to destroy the ceiling to the secret area where he destroys the chain or rope or whatever that's holding up the chandelier. For the fight against the Watchers, again, he's going to do what I talked about earlier with trying to get soul with nail hits when they're standing there and getting his optimal cast in as possible when they're roly poly olied up. Lep is now going to make his way to the first Dreamer in the run by doing a ton of wall jumping to get up there, and once he gets to the Dreamer, he'll just have to hit it a handful of times to collect the Dreamer and unlock the first of the three seals. While he does that, I'd just like to say, as always, that I hope you're all doing well. If you're not, then I'd just like to remind you, as always, that no feeling is final. No matter how dark things may be right now, you are not defined by that, and any feelings of dread or despair will come to pass. Those feelings do not control your life and do not define who you are as a person, and they cannot take tomorrow away from you. Additionally, we're all human. We've all been through difficult times, and most people can relate to others when talking about low periods. Please keep that in mind and reach out to others if you need someone to talk to. I guarantee that they won't look at you like you have three heads because mental health struggles are normal and real and talking about it is one of the best things you can do for yourself. You are not a burden. Getting back to the run, now that he's collected the first streamer, he calls the elevator before inventory dropping down the shaft so that the elevator is moving up and isn't blocking the bottom when he gets there. He's going to do another transitional wall cling storage when he drops to the next room on the right up here, pogoing while he does it so that he doesn't grab the wall and slow down, and uses this to be able to dash repeatedly to reach a Haloness seal he grabs. This wall cling storage here saves 0.2 seconds. The Haloness seal is a relic that he can sell for 450 geo, and he got an additional 655 from the chest he opened. After dropping down a it, he's then going to navigate through the dark room again, but it's much easier to maneuver through it going this way since he just needs to hold left and doesn't need to jump up on anything. Right now he's making his way to grab one more relic, and then he'll go and sell them all to get a bunch of Geo so that he'll be mostly set for the run. He's going to be hitting a bunch of enemies for additional soul, and after finishing dropping down in this room and entering the room on the left, he'll be in a big open room with a fountain where he's going to talk to an NPC at the fountain to send him back to his shop, otherwise he'd just stand there admiring the view. In the following room, he's going to hit a lever to call an elevator for later and then when he goes back outside into the rain, he's going to do what he considers to be the single hardest trick in the run, rafters skip. He wants to climb up high onto a platform in the room to get the last relic, and instead of going all the way to the left and riding an elevator up, he'll first pogo off a husk and then get hit by a venge fly, which sends him up and away. He'll then pogo off the venge fly once to gain a little more height, dash to maintain the height and move left a bit, then shoot a couple fireballs to stall in air so that the venge fly can make it back to him and damage him again. This sends him up and away again, where he does another pogo off the venge fly to gain the last bit of height, where he dashes left into the platform that he then wall jumps off of to keep going up. In order to wall jump, you need the bottom half of your body to be against a wall, and as you can see in this freeze frame, it's a pretty close call, so in order to execute this skip, you really have to take advantage of the height you gain and do everything at the apex of your launches and pogos. It's really difficult, like Lep says it's the single hardest trick in terms of execution, but it saves around 15 seconds, which is huge in this category. After performing rafter skip, he climbs up a little more and lures a winged sentry over so he can pogo off it to reach the even higher platforms where he does a couple quick wall jumps to reach the Hallow Nest seal, which again, sells for 450 geo. When he heads back inside here, he'll jump over a heavy sentry, then drop down to where he'll slash left to hit a lever to open a gate that takes a while to open, then dash right to talk to that dude from outside who's now back at his shop. 
He sells all three relics that he's collected so far to get an additional 1,100 Geo, and at this point in the run, the amount of Geo he wants to have is at least 2,357. In this run though, he was just a touch short, and is a little poor boy with only having 2,348 Geo instead of 2,357. Wow, just so poor. There are a couple ways to most optimally get the last bit of Geo, like kill the enemy at the end of the fountain room who would drop the exact 9 Geo he needs, but there's always a chance of Geo going stray and you having to go out of your way to grab it, so he decided to hold off for now. It doesn't matter too much though, as long as he has enough by the time he does the last shopping bit by the end, then he's all good. So he's currently dashing across the map on his way to unlock another stag station, and at the start of the next room, he's going to do a pretty tight jump where he'll take advantage of what the Hollow Knight community often refers to as coyote frames. This is where he's going to run off a ledge and jump while he's in air just after leaving the ledge, as if he were Wily e. Coyote. This is a pretty common concept in gaming, and Hollow Knight is no exception. On the right side of the coyote frames room, he'll climb up into the stag station where he's going to purchase the station, and rather than wait for the toll sign to lower, bell to raise, and ring it and wait for the stag to run in, he's going to pay the toll, then exit the room. This skips the animation of the toll lowering and bell raising, and he then pops back in and shoots a fireball to ring the bell before exiting and entering again to skip the stag running up animation. This doesn't save any time in real time, but speedruns of this game are timed with in-game time, and since he's dashing through a transition, he saves about one second. He then uses the stag to travel to Dirtmouth because he's going to do some shopping. After wall jumping up when he loads in, he hits the lever to open the station's gate and then sits on the bench outside to update his respawn position to hear for a save quit later. He then goes in the shop and speaks with Sly, whom he woke up earlier, and buys the Lumafly Lantern, which brightens dark areas around you. This is because there's one upcoming room that he can't navigate in the dark like the one earlier, and he needs the lantern to see. It's not because he's afraid of the dark and keeps a nightlight in bed with him on an extension cord like I do, Fire Marshal be damned. He then rides the stag to the Forgotten Crossroads where he's going to do a bunch of pogos and wall jumps to climb up to the pathway to Crystal Peak. The pathway to Crystal Peak is the one room he needs the lantern for because he has to pay a toll to enter Crystal Peak, but you can't interact with the toll in the dark. There is another way into Crystal Peak, but you need to have the dive spell, which would take longer to go get than to buy the lantern. So Crystal Peak has a bunch of conveyor belts laying around, and Lep is going to use them to his advantage as much as possible by trying to move slash ride on the ones moving the direction he's headed, while having as little contact as possible with the ones that are going opposite to his direction. His movement is actually routed out so that he lands on the conveyor belts going the same direction as him as far left as he can, that way he takes advantage of the added speed from the belt while his dash is on cooldown. In the next room, he does a skip called Pogax, where he climbs up the right wall, then pogos off a pickaxe a husk miner throws, letting him get to the upper level and save on somewhere between 3-5 to five seconds of running to the left and climbing up and around. So the way the enemies work in the next room is their position is always consistent, but the laser attack they do isn't. They decide whether or not they're going to do it once you're in their range. In the top right of the room, he'll go between an enemy's hurtbox and laser, which is a gap that's like the perfect width of the knight's hurtbox and requires a frame-perfect input to squeeze through. Just a casual, insanely precise backup strat he did since he got hit by a laser earlier in the room. Overall, all the laser shenanigans in that room just make it really annoying for runners. After breezing through that last room, he's going to do some dashing through a couple more and will then do a couple inventory drops, including the longest inventory drop in the run, which is the second one he does. The timing on ending this inventory drop is really difficult due to how fast you fall and the fact your vision is obscured by the inventory, and in this run, Lep dashed out of it just a little too early and bonked on the conveyor belt before dropping down to head to the next room. In a moment, he'll shoot a fireball to stall himself in air to kill just enough time to be able to dash so he lands on the platform and didn't need to wall jump off the side of it. The lasers up here are always on a set cycle so the movement is always the same, and up here he does a strat called Underplat where he drops underneath the platform and dashes just above the crystals. Even though it looks like he hits the crystals in his dash and should take damage, their hitboxes are a lot smaller than they look so he was totally clear of them. He then grabs this conveyor that's going down to instantly be moving down at the conveyor's speed, and down here he goes up to the old mining golem and from it retrieves the crystal heart, which gives the super dash ability, which I'll be referring to as C dash as short for crystal dash. This ability lets him charge up and blast forwards, where he'll fly forward until interrupted by damage, the environment, or by pressing jump or the C dash button again. He quits out and loads back in so that he's then relocated all the way back up to Dirtmouth where he rested at the bench where he does a C dash right away. C dash is a bit faster than dashing regularly, so when he needs to span longer distances, this is going to be his go-to way to move around now. It was also the last ability he needed to get to do the remaining sequence breaks, and now that he has it, he's on his way to take out the two remaining dreamers and finish the game. One of the main reasons he needs C dash is in two rooms. He's going to use it to get over an acid pool. You can swim through acid pools instead of having to dash over them if you get the Isma's tier ability, but on this patch, it's faster to get C dash. So here he does an acid skip by grabbing the wall just above the acid and dashing above the acid before wall jumping on the other side. Here he'll drop a huge distance, but because of all the platforms, he has to move around and dodge 
them, so he doesn't do an inventory drop here. So the dreamer that he's making his way to right now is Monomon the teacher, who's guarded by Umu. They're located inside the teacher's archives, which Lep will enter in the next room. Inside the archives, he's going to do a transition walkling storage where, again, he'll do a pogo so that he doesn't cling to the wall and lose any speed as he drops into the following room. He does this so he's able to dash past an enemy and not get hit by it on the first cycle. He'll then take some intentional damage after an inventory drop since it's faster than waiting for a window without damage. He'll follow this by C-dashing over some acid, then dropping down to the fight against Umu, who's THE auto-scroller boss and who's very RNG-based. Umu has two attacks it can do, a fast one and a slow one, with the slow one being around two seconds slower. You can't damage Umu while it's flying around like this. You have to wait until it does a certain number of attacks before an NPC named Quarrel comes out of nowhere to attack it and make it susceptible to damage. Lep stands in a specific spot to lure Umu to the center of the stage, where after Quarrel attacks, Lep does 150 damage by casting, doing nail hits to get soul, and landing a double hit at the end. Umu has 300 health total, so by doing this twice in a row, he'll be able to barely kill Umu. And this is only doable thanks to nail cancelling because otherwise he wouldn't be able to get the right amount of attacks in in time. Although he can't damage Umu while it's flying around doing attacks, he can still do dream nail hits to build up soul and by extension, health. In this fight, despite him executing exactly how he's supposed to, Lep didn't have the best luck in terms of attacks Umu did, and overall he lost around 15 seconds compared to what a good Umu fight would be. Thankfully, Umu can't do the same attack more than twice in a row, so there is a bit of a limit to how slow the fight can be with good execution. After defeating Umu, Lep will do a timed setup where he dashes into the gate to leave the arena right as it opens, which lets him set up walkling storage on it so he can dash repeatedly over some acid he's going to drop down to here. Even though he doesn't need C-dash to get over the acid and he could have just come here earlier and walkling storaged over it like this, because of that topology rule I mentioned earlier, he's only allowed to come here and walkling storage over the acid after he has the ability that would let him get over the acid normally. Up here at the top, he jumps so that he walklings to the very top right edge of the tank the Dreamer is in and dashes off it to land at the perfect distance to where he's standing exactly at the edge of Quirrell's text trigger, which minimizes the distance the knight walks once dialogue begins. After then charging up a Dream Nail, he's able to enter the hidden dream and beat the Light Pinata to collect Monomon. Something worth mentioning is that there's usually a cutscene that plays when you collect each of the Dreamers, but on this patch you're able to skip the cutscenes, while on current patches you cannot. Playing on the older patch to skip the cutscenes is actually the biggest time save between playing on the old patch versus new. So like I said earlier, Lep has all his needed skills at this point, and aside from needing to collect 9 Geo, he can just gun it to the Dreamers into the end of the game. He's now going to just go straight to the final Dreamer, who's located pretty far away in Deep Nest. First, he has to exit the teacher's archives though, which is actually Lep's favorite movement in the game. So there are two ways to get to Deep Nest, through a collapsible floor in the western part of Fungal Waste, or you can cut through the Queen's Gardens, which is one of the endgame areas that you need a lot of abilities to get through, including the wings, a bunch of charms, a bunch of health, and there are also bosses there who deal double damage. It's a much scarier area to try to go through, but it is around 40 seconds faster than Fungal Waste, so I'm sure you can guess where Lep is headed now. So earlier in the run, Lep did what he considered to be the hardest trick in the game, Rafter's Skip. And coming up, he's going to do a different, very hard trick that a lot of other runners consider to be the hardest trick in the game, Queen's Garden Acid Skip. To skip to Queen's Garden, he has to cross an acid pool with a huge spiky vine blocking the middle of the room, so he needs to do what he did with the acid skip earlier and cling to the wall close to the acid to dash over the acid but under the spikes. This is incredibly difficult because of how low the spikes extend, so he has to get really close to the acid, plus the window to perform the dash to cling to the wall is only two frames. Lep agrees that this trick is very hard, but finds it a touch easier than Rafter's skip since this acid skip isn't as punishing if you miss and is a bit more lenient. It's still an absolute absolutely absurd trick though. As he makes his way through Queen's Gardens to Deep Nest, he'll try to get pop shots in on enemies to build up soul, but tries to not let it take away from time where he could be C-dashing. He doesn't really need to get anything in Queen's Gardens, although he does have a combat encounter up here where he needs to defeat three Mantis Petras, which is why he's trying to build up his soul to max. He hits the first Mantis twice to max out his soul, then double hits it with a fireball before then double hitting the other two Mantises with two more fireballs to clear them both out so the gate to leave this room opens. Down here, he's then going to do a neat little trick called a Hazard Warp. So normally when you 
at a hazard like spikes or thorns, you respawn at a nearby location that's predetermined by hitboxes on the hazard. Like, for example, if you hit these spikes, you respawn here. It's important to note that hitting these hazards isn't the same as dying, which is why you just respawn somewhere before the hazard and not at a bench. Anyways, you hit a hazard, you respawn before the hazard. A hazard warp, though, is when you take advantage of errors in the placement of the hazard respawn hitboxes. For example, over here there's a respawn hitbox poking through these spikes. This hitbox corresponds with hazards that are lower down in the room and causes you to respawn at a location that's related to those lower hazards. So what Lep is going to do is fall on these spikes at exactly the spot where the lower hazard respawn hitbox pokes through, which causes him to respawn at that other location and skip a bit of platforming. This is a hazard warp, and this one saves 5 seconds. So when he does the hazard warp, he spawns at a lever that he hits, which opens a gate to the next room that he enters right up here. Earlier in the video, I mentioned how the route was recently changed when he fought the Moss Knights for Geo, and there's a bit of added differences with the route change that essentially boil down to you not being able to do a full heal in the old route, which made the run really sweaty going into Deep Nest and the Beast's Den. Thankfully, that's all changed and it's much safer now for several reasons, such as not needing soul and not being as worried with having the right amount of health when intentionally taking damage. After doing this inventory drop, Lep officially enters Deep Nest where he does another one and gets extremely unlucky by dropping into this enemy here who rarely ever gets in the way. Similar to earlier, he doesn't actually need anything in Deep Nest, he just needs to get to where the final Dreamer is located which is on the far west side of the area so he's just gunning it through these rooms. I particularly like the room after this one so how about I shut up for a moment so we can enjoy it. Damn it, sorry about that. I'm sick, I ruined the moment. So the movement in this room is really scary, like if you fall here, you have to take a detour to get back up and you lose around 30 seconds. So to get to the final dreamer, he has to sit on this trap bench and slowly get captured. There's actually another dev intended skip in this room where you can use the wings to fly up to a hole in the ceiling and you can use wall cling storage to get to it. Like I've talked about a couple times now, the topology rule is in place and that would actually go against said rule to do right now in this category, so he has to sit on the bench. That skip is used in other categories though, namely ones where you either have the wings or where the topology rule doesn't apply. When the screen fades in from black, Lep breaks out of the webs and as soon as the knight lands on the ground and the game auto saves, he quits out and loads back in. Quitting out heals you back to max, which is why he did it, but it gets rid of all your soul, which is okay since he didn't need it right now anyway. He's going to mash Dream Nail during the load in, which causes him to start in the upright position and able to move right away instead of laying on the ground, and then he's going to go up where he'll do Devout Skip. Up in this pathway he's going to enter, there's a stalking devout blocking the way. In the older route I talked about earlier, runners would kill this devout with fireballs for the geo, but because he killed the moss knights earlier, he doesn't need to do that anymore. Killing this devout efficiently is really only doable with fireballs, so in the old route you couldn't do a quit out when you got out of the web because quitting out drains your soul. Because he doesn't need to kill the devout for the geo anymore though, having no soul isn't an issue. And additionally, he has full health which is helpful since to begin devout skip, he has to tank some damage right away so that he has invincibility ability frames where you can walk right up to the devout without getting knocked away. Anyway, the devout's hitbox is a triangle, shaped like this, and Lep is going to pogo off it and wedge himself between the devout and a spot where there's a wall to his right that's bracing him in place. As the devout then runs to the right, Lep will dash to stay in the air a little longer for safety, then fall down on the other side of the devout and be able to progress through the area to the dreamer. So again, he dream nails as he loads in so he's able to move slightly sooner and after wall jumping up here, he's going to do devout skip which saves around 4 seconds or so. Also, worth noting, right now it shows that he has 5 health but that's just a visual bug caused by the quit out where his HUD didn't fully load in by the time he did devout skip and he only has 4 health at the moment. Lep smacks the spiders as he moves past them for the soul and the spiders are in random positions and change directions at random with zero indication. And similar to the laser enemies earlier, they fire randomly while you're in range of them so this entire section is based very much on reactions as a runner. This is the type of randomness that can keep a section in a speedrun super interesting, where unlike Umu where you lose time based on randomness, the randomness here doesn't necessarily lose you time, you just have to adapt to it, which keeps this section interesting for runners. He just took out the last devout of the area because unfortunately there's no skip for that guy, but it's no biggie since Lep needed the geo from it anyway. 
He's then going to go and beat up this last pinata, and earlier I talked about how he's a bit short on Geo. He got 43 from that devout, but right now he needs 250, so he's short 9, but there is one more place to get Geo, although it'll lose him 0.8 seconds. Aside from the horribly long detour to get the Geo, he's just going to be gunning it to the end of the game now. So Lep currently has one hit in his soul meter, which is how it always works out due to the damage rotation on the Devout. And the minor detour to get the Geo is how he destroys this deposit to collect a handful of the Geo that pops out as he falls. As he passes another Devout up here, he gets two hits of Solon, which gives him just enough to do a cast, and he's now just dipping from the area. When he exits the Beast Den to Deep Nest, he's going to climb up into the right, where conveniently there's a Stag Station. He hasn't purchased this one yet, and he needs to call the Stag as well, so he's going to do the same thing he did earlier where he pays the toll, which costs the 250 Geo. Geo, leaves, re-enters to shoot the fireball, leave again, and re-enter to ride the stag. Doing it this time is slightly faster overall since he now has C dash. He'll then interact with the stag to ride it back to Dirtmouth since it's the closest station to the door to the end of the game, and now that he's collected all three dreamers, all the seals have unlocked and he can fight the final boss, the Hollow Knight. This run is performed by, god no I stopped myself that time. When he exits the station here, he's going to dash into the well to the right and drop down. He's going to pause, unpause to gain control as he falls, so he skips the hard fall and is able to move up to the right where he'll C-dash off a wall. He didn't pause, unpause the two other times he dropped through the well because the first time he didn't have dash or anything, so he would have just hard fell slightly to the left, and the second time he needed to land anyways to C-dash. When he arrives at the Temple of the Black Egg, he goes inside where the unsealed door to the end is located. After opening and entering it, he'll C-dash down the long corridor to the next room where to begin the final boss fight, he has to break some chains, causing the Hollow Knight to drop to the ground. Then it scream real big. This fight in principle is similar to Watcher Knights, where at some points he'll be able to hit them with his nail and other times he won't, so he gets hits in with his nail when he can and casts when appropriate. The Hollow Knight, THK for short, also has an attack that gives a window for Lep to multi-hit them with his cast, similar to the Watcher Knight's role, so he always wants to have a bit of extra soul in case that happens. Each attack THK can do has an optimal and predetermined response that Lep is going to do, and they can do pretty much any attack at any time, so this fight is very random. For example, when Whenever they do this sweeping 3 slash attack, Lep will pogo over them. During this first phase, THK has a smaller pool of attacks they can do, such as the 3 slash one and a dash attack. Worth mentioning as well, similar to the fight against Hornet earlier, THK staggers after a certain number of hits. Lep takes advantage of this by counting the hits he lands so that he knows when he's about to stagger them, and can time out hits so that the stagger interrupts certain attacks like the dash attack. He needs to hit them pretty constantly to keep the stagger count low though. If there's a long enough time between your hits, the required number of hits to stagger actually increases. This can be caused by either just not attacking constantly or by attacking THK when they parry, which is one of their moves it has access to in phase 1, which causes you to be unable to attack for a certain amount of time. Also, reliably partway through the fight, THK stops getting staggered. If you stagger them 5 times, then they won't get staggered anymore, but other than that, sometimes they just stop being able to get staggered and no one too sure why, it just stops happening. Like I just mentioned, they have a parry move that they occasionally use as well, and if you attack into it, be it a nail hit or a fireball, the game will freeze for 0.2 to 0.3 seconds and then they swing an attack at you, so when you see a parry thrown out, you just have to wait. The best move that THK can do here though is the dash that I mentioned earlier because Lep can multi-hit them with a fireball during it. This means that the best move for them to do in the speedrun is the dash, while the triple slash is pretty good as well since you can build up soul during it, and parry is the worst since you have to stand and wait. Lep is able to read when THK is going to do a dash based on the windup where they jump back and hold up their weapon, and Lep times out the fireball by jumping over them and shooting a fireball when they're right under him. THK starts with 1000 health, and once you lower their health to 750, they enter the second phase where they have two additional attacks they can perform, the Flame Pillar and the Blob Barrage. These attacks don't really come out too often though. Once their health is then lowered to 400, they gain three more attacks, one where they hover and shoot a bunch of blobs, one where they bounce around and try to hit you, and one where they self-stab over and over, during which all damage dealt to them is lowered to one. Despite his attacks only dealing one damage during self-stab, Lep is going to take advantage of this time by doing as many nail hits 
minutes as possible and only casting fireballs if his soul meter gets full and he has enough time to refill it, because getting one extra point of damage in is better than not. It doesn't seem like casting the one fireball during the self stabs is really worth it since it's just one extra hit, but if the fight ends with self stabs, then you need to do one less attack, so you'd save around 0.4 seconds from doing that, so may as well. When THK does the bouncing around attack, Lep is going to try to trace their movement as much as possible and not only get nail hits in, but cast a couple of fireballs. Lep and other newer runners used to not cast fireballs during this attack and just go for nail hits, but when they were reviewing an old community best video, they noticed that Fireborn was able to cast fireball during that attack and still land an upslash nail hit afterwards, so the community started to adopt that attack pattern. The bounce attack used to be one of the worst ones to get because of how slow it was, but now that they cast during it, it isn't too bad. As the fight approaches the end, THK is going to build up for a scream, and when they scream, it locks you in place wherever you're at for a moment. Even if you're in the air, your movement stops and you drop to the ground. When Lep is anticipating the scream, he's going to jump above THK so that when the scream happens, he's pulled to the ground and bumps into THK, which damages him and gives him control again, similar to when he intentionally tanked damage when grabbing the Mantis Claw earlier to gain control slightly earlier. During the rest of the scream, THK takes full damage, so Lep is just going to wail on them with fireballs. Overall, the scream skip saves 4 seconds. There's another guaranteed scream earlier in the fight, but THK doesn't stop beforehand, which makes it pretty unreactable. That scream itself is also much shorter and followed with self-stabs, so you don't get nearly as much damage in. Anyways, once he defeats THK, the run will officially end around 25 seconds after the last hit lands, which is right when the final cutscene starts. Alright, that all being covered, let's see this final fight play out. Because Lep didn't acquire the Void Heart during the run, that means that the official ending he gets is the Hollow Knight ending, where the Knight absorbs the infection into themselves and is then sealed inside the Black Egg, becoming the new Hollow Knight. So if you've made it to the end of this video, thank you so much on behalf of both myself and Lep. And additionally, I'd like to give a huge thank you to Lep for helping make this video. Working with him was both super easy and incredibly enjoyable, and I can't recommend enough that you check out his stuff. He streams runs of Hollow Knight occasionally on Twitch and posts VODs to YouTube, so be sure to check him out there. Links are in the description. Also, thank you so much to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon. Without you, these videos would not be possible. By contributing on Patreon, you get access to videos early and without ads, access to occasional livestream Q&As, the ability to vote on future 
future videos, and more, including some new stuff I have planned like reviewing and talking about old speedrun explains that I've made. Monetary support is entirely unnecessary, but you patrons still do it anyway to help support the channel, and I appreciate it greatly. So again, thank you to all of you who support the channel through Patreon. And lastly, as always, be sure to check out the Tomato Anus Discord server. It's a super chill and inclusive place that totally hasn't had a small cult develop centered around one of the emotes that we have. Totally not a thing that's happening that I partake in. That's all for this video though. This was an any percent no major glitches speedrun of Hollow Knight, I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day.